Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Adam Gillis. I'm the alumni and group manager of Harriet Watts, and it's a pleasure today to welcome you to the special alumni event, which makes up part of Harriet Watts' annual celebration week. Celebration week is happening across our global campuses this week and starting today. Uh, in the past, uh, Celebration Week has been uh, very internal and staff focused, and it's a series of events that celebrates the work we do within the university. But this year, we wanted to involve our alumni community too, and we're so pleased you can join us at this event today. So in just a moment, I'll pass across to Professor Patrick Corbett, who is not only an academic and senior member of staff at Heritage Watts, he's also an alumnus, uh, and he's currently our Watt Club Council Vice President. He also held the position of university poet in recent years. Professor Corbett will introduce Dr. Sam Illingworth, Associate Professor at Edinburgh Napier University, who will deliver his talk on science communication through poetry. They will then have a discussion and some readings of their work. At the end of the session, uh, there will be time for uh, questions and answers. If, but at any point uh, during the session you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to put that in a comment in the chat box. Just to inform you, this event will be recorded. We will be sharing a recording of it on YouTube in due course. So to kickstart uh, this online event, Professor Corbett has selected a poem that he'd like us to play. And quite appropriately, uh, this poem is entitled Zoom and was written and is read by Poet Laureate Simon Armitage. I'll just share that now. Zoom. It begins as a house. An end terrace in this case, but it will not stop there. Soon it is an avenue which cambers arrogantly past the Mechanics Institute, turns left at the main road without even looking, and quickly it is a town with all four major clearing banks, a daily paper and a football team pushing for promotion. On it goes, oblivious to the planning act, the green belts, and before we know it, it is out of our hands. City, nation, hemisphere, universe, hammering out in all directions until suddenly, mercifully, it is drawn aside through the eye of a black hole and bulleted into a neighbouring galaxy, emerging smaller and smoother than a billiard ball, but weighing more than Saturn. People stop me in the street, badger me in the checkout queue and ask, what is this, this that is so small and so very smooth, but whose mass is greater than the ringed planet? It's just words, I assure them, but they will not have it. Well, thank you, Adam, for that uh, introduction. As he, Adam said, that was uh, Simon Armitage, who recorded that uh, for, for us for the um, 200th anniversary of the starting of the Mechanics Institutes. And that's why the poem referred to the Mechanics Institutes. And of course, Harriet Watt was the very first Mechanics Institute uh, and we are celebrating our bicentenary this academic year. As Adam said, I'm uh, involved both uh, uh, with the Watt Club, um, which allows me to sort of bring or try to bring new things uh, to, to the audience of Harriet Watt that especially things that are a little bit outside our normal track uh, of events. And certainly poetry is one of those things. Uh, as the former university poet, I was always wanting to push the communication of science uh, through the use of poetry. And, you know, it's really nice to have Sam Ellingworth, who is, um, you know, par excellence in that area. He's a world leader in the promotion of uh, science and poetry, uh, communication of science through poetry. Um, and I think we've got a biography of, of, of Sam's here just to bring up. Uh, he is, as Adam said, the Associate Professor in Academic Practice at Napier, uh, and lives very close to Harriet Watt campus. Uh, before that, he was um, at the University of Western Australia briefly, largely through the pandemic, I think. Before that, Manchester Metropolitan. And Manchester Metropolitan is where he did his MA on poetry and higher education. And it was uh, reading this uh, thesis of Sam's that inspired us to uh, create a Harriet Watt Poetry and Practice Group, which has run for several years. Um, and we'll make sure you have the details if anybody's interested in joining that. Uh, we meet monthly and discuss poetry. Before that, he was uh, a, a scientist. He has a PhD in atmospheric physics from the University of Leicester. 
uh, following on from a, a, a four-year MSc on physics and space technology. So he's definitely a, has worked uh, and as a research scientist um, and now uh, is involved mostly in application of poetry. And he will tell you a lot about the things that he's involved in, uh, some of which I've listed there, um, including very importantly these days, poetry uh, on both undeserved audience, but also environmental change, uh, those things. And uh, as we are all uh, on an alumni chat, he's also operated as the annual fund locator for the University of Leicester. So we're always interested in uh, accumulating funds to support the students in their activities at all universities and what is no different in that respect. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Sam, who's then going to talk for uh, half an hour or so, and then we'll have some readings and some discussion perhaps after that. Sam, the stage is yours. Thanks so much, Pat, and it's uh, great to be here today. I didn't know that, that my master's thesis was the inspiration for poetry and practice at Harriet Watt, so that's really good to hear. Um, so hi everyone, as Pat said, my name's Sam, um, I'm an associate professor in academic practice, and a lot of my work really is around developing dialogues between different audiences and in particular trying to give voice to those audiences who've been denied a voice um, thinking about um, non-scientists and really thinking about how we can communicate science to non-scientists and with non-scientists as well so I'm going to speak for about 20-25 minutes something like that and then Pat, will, Pat and I are going to read some poems and there'll be a chance for questions as well. If you've got any questions or comments, just post them in the chat and, and I'll address them towards the end. And if you want to reach out to me um, at the end of this talk, my email address and Twitter handle are there and, and please feel free to do so. So I just want to talk, first of all, about, about science communication, because it's a word that we probably hear quite a lot. Um, and this is really just to say that science communication exists on a spectrum. So there's, there's very different ways we can communicate science. So the ways which we're probably the most au fait with would be dissemination. So this is the idea that I'm a scientist and I'm disseminating my knowledge to others. So I want to tell other people about the work that I'm doing because I think it's important or because I think it's interesting or because I think it will have an impact on their system them or their community or society and other examples of dissemination might be writing a, a piece in a popular magazine or um, a documentary or appearing on the radio or something like that moving across we could have dialogue so this is really moving beyond a one-way direction of communication so instead of me the scientist communicating my research to a non-scientist it's talking to non-scientists and asking them what their expertise is, what their knowledge is, what their interests are. And as well as listening to that, using that to maybe help me think about my future direction of research as well. And then at the far end, we'd also have participation. So it's how we can get non-scientists involved in scientific research, things like citizen science, things like public um, practitioner interfaces, that kind of work. Um, and this is to say that there's not one side of the spectrum that's better than the other, but rather they just exist across a spectrum. And many examples of science communication tend to be grounded in dissemination, and that's fine, but there's also a need to maybe move beyond that. And in particular, to be thinking about how and why scientists can listen to non-scientists to develop their work. So an example I always think about is um, developing flood risk mitigation strategies. So if you imagine that you are a scientist and you're developing a mitigation strategy for flooding in a, let's say, in inner city region, you can develop um, data, you can look at um, flood mo models, you can look at fluvial dynamics, you can look at satellite imagery, and you can think of what the best possible mitigation strategy would be. But you should also go and talk to the people that live there because these are people who've lived there for 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And that is an um, amount of data, but it's also people who have knowledge and expertise and lived experience even though they're not necessarily scientists. So 
good scientists should go and speak to these people, listen to what their opinions are, what their needs are. They'll know which areas may or may not be appropriate for flood risk mitigation. And it will also grant them greater agency so that when you then come to develop the um, implementation of your proposal, people are much more likely to take it on board. So that's what I mean by establishing dialogue and then moving towards participation as well. And, and I'll come back to those a little bit later. I'm just going to give some examples now, really, of how we can use poetry as a medium across the spectrum of science communication. And one of the ways in which we can do this is using poetry to communicate. So this, this one way direction of travel. So I have a poetry blog and podcast called The Poetry of Science, um, which you can find here or just by Googling The Poetry of Science. And basically each week I read a piece of scientific research and write a poem about it and then publish it on my blog and my podcast. And this blog's been going for about seven years now. And initially when I started it off, it was just something that seemed quite interesting. I've always been interested in poetry, but it was quite forced rhymes, you know, things like, and now the ocean acidification of the sea has risen by a factor of 0.23, not particularly enjoyable for anybody. Um, but, and you know, when it started off, the blog was read by maybe 20, 30 people a month, something like that. Um, but I got good feedback and, and, and I listened and, and I developed it. And, and eventually I realized that actually the poem itself doesn't need to describe exactly the scientific research. Instead, what it can do is it can present an additional lens through which to view the research so that hopefully after reading my poem, people are encouraged to find out more about the science. I also provide a um, non-expert summary and a link to the scientific research. And this is because, you know, science is important, but science is also weird and strange and exciting and, and scary. But if you're just reading a scientific abstract, it's not necessarily the most accessible way to be introduced to that scientific research if you're not an expert. So hopefully my blog and my podcast communicate this in a different way and encourage people to find out more about it. To give you an example of what this looks like in practice. So this is a recent paper um, called Global Collision Risk Hotspots of Marine Traffic and the World's Largest Fish, the Whale Shark. So this is really interesting research that was looking at um, basically it mapped out a lot of tagged whale sharks. So whale sharks, which are the second largest fish in the sea, uh, sorry, the largest fish in the sea. And basically they, a lot of them have been tagged with identification so that you can follow where they're going. And what they did was they, they followed a lot of the tracks of these whale sharks and then laid that over major international shipping lanes. And they found that about 92% of the um, migration patterns of whale sharks fall into these major international shipping lanes, which means that a large proportion of whale sharks are probably being killed by um, huge industrial shippers hitting, shipping containers, et cetera, hitting them, which is like quite an underreported problem. So this is a really interesting study. It's a very well-written abstract, actually, but mainly for an expert audience. So I wrote this poem as a way to hopefully try to get people to think about it in a different way. Greys and whites split the sea, mottled flecks of cream that simmer in the surf, hinting at the beasts that lurk beneath. Metallic vessels tower overhead, global fleets of freight and load that cut through filtered lanes with wanton ease striking their unheeded prey with hidden blows of pride and gall and steel. A clumsy chant to stiff remains that fall to the floor without a sound. So that's a way that we can potentially use poetry to communicate scientific research two people. But we can also use poetry as data. And, and this is something that I find to be really interesting. So um, 
for example, there's a in, in qualitative research, which is just research that's using rather than numbers, let's say words. So traditionally, we might look at um, interview responses or focus group responses or survey responses and read all of these responses to see if there was any emerging narrative. Um, so, for example, if we wanted to find out about people's attitudes towards um, the bicentennial uh, anniversary of Harriet Watt, we might survey, uh, I don't know, let's say 300 people and ask them, what's your impression of Harriet Watt? And then in reading those responses, we'd look to see if there were any emergent narratives or emergent, um, I guess, collections of thought. So people might say, oh, this is a university that I strongly associate with engineering, or this is a university that I strongly associate with Harriet Watt, or this is a university that I strongly associate with the local community. So in reading these responses, we, we, we read through them, and rather than performing a um, like regressional analysis or something that we would with quantitative or numbered data, we instead look for emergent narratives. And this is quite like a well-established research methodology. But something that I've done recently, which I think is really interesting, is rather than using um, interviews or focus groups, we actually use poetry. So this is a methodology called poetic content analysis. Uh, and basically it involves reading lots and lots of different poems about a particular subject to see if there are any emerging themes or emerging narratives and what that can tell us. So for example, the paper on the left is a research study that looked at about 72 poems written about climate change. And I wanted to really see, you know, poets have a really specific way of expressing ideas and, and they're very good normally at localizing problems or personifying issues. So I wanted to see if by reading poems about climate change, they could maybe help people who communicate climate change to think about how they could improve their message and what the emergent narratives and themes were. So in reading this, like what was really interesting, it seems obvious in hindsight, was that the poets really centered the human experience when they were writing about climate change. So when we talk about climate change or the climate crisis, it's very easy for it to you know, be this esoteric large idea that's happening somewhere else in the world. What is it's happening everywhere and it's affecting the planet, but it's also affecting people and it's caused by people. And that recentering to remind us about the importance of the human, both causing and being affected by, was really powerful to emerge from this po these poems and is a potential way that we could help reframe climate change discourse going forward. Similarly, the paper on the right, which I conducted with my colleague Ariana Soldati, was looking at um, poems written over the past 220 years about volcanoes, um, because we wanted to see how poets had potentially captured the relationship between humans and volcanoes and how that had maybe changed over this 200 odd year period. And we wanted to have this period of time because it kind of um, covers the, the movement really, you know, around the 1820s was when science first started to become professionalized. So over that 200 year period, it's really interesting to see how um, the relationship between science and the relationship between volcanoes and, and humans has maybe changed. Um, and again, some of the emergent themes for that was that it's definitely moved from this very um, almost, I guess, you know, in aw awesome relationship to one where it is much more mutual and thinking about um, how the volcano, but also humans can be beneficial to one another as well. So this is just to show how we can actually use poetry itself as a way to explore scientific ideas and, and how we might communicate science to others, either through communicating climate change or thinking about how we communicate um, the risks and benefits to a community living in and around a volcano. Where I think poetry is most effective, however, for communicating science is through developing dialogue um, and potentially participation. So, you know, I talked earlier about the need for scientists to work with non-scientists and to listen to their voices, um, but, but this can be quite hard. So 
even really engaging non-patronizing scientists when we bring together scientists and non-scientists into a room and encourage them to have a dialogue unfortunately what can happen is there can be established what i call hierarchies of intellect so this idea that a, a scientist is perceived to be more intelligent even maybe because of the numbers of letters after their name etc so again thinking about that example of flood risk mitigation even if you're someone who's lived in a region for like 50 60 years and is an expert in your own professional sphere oftentimes it's difficult to see yourself on a par with scientists and, and that's what our research has shown as well so we need to try to level these hierarchies so that the non-scientists feel as though they're actually part of the same society as the scientists, which they are. Um, and one of the ways in which we do this is writing poetry and, and poetry writing workshops. So what we do is we bring together scientists and non-scientists and we write poems together and we use those poems as a starting point for dialogue. And this works for three reasons. One, it gives permission to the non-scientists to share their voice because it's it's much harder to criticize someone for sharing a poem than an opinion. So it grants them permission to share their lived experience, their tacit knowledge, their expertise. Number two, it gives permission to the scientists to display an element of pathos or emotion that they're not normally allowed to display when talking about their work. You know, but for many scientists, when they're talking about their work, they get excited about it or they get nervous or scared or upset about the consequences of their research and by not sharing that emotion we actually put up a barrier between science and society and help to reinforce stereotypes of scientists being these you know extremely um, non-sociable and interactive people which just isn't the case and then finally it grants permission and creates a sense of shared vulnerability um, by which i mean if you see a non-scientist stand up and read a dirty limerick or um, a really bad haiku, or if you see a professor stand up and read, you know, a poorly rhymed sonnet, then you realise that actually there isn't a hierarchy and we're all part of a wider society. So writing these poems together is a really powerful way of, of starting that dialogue. Um, so these two papers here really look at um, research where we've done this with different communities especially marginalized communities around environmental change so working with people who identify as asylum seekers or refugees or people living with mental health needs or people living with um, disabilities and their carers members of religious organizations people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and in all of these instances what we found is that by engendering this dialogue it doesn't just lead to barriers or like the observation of barriers it leads to potential solutions um I'm, I'm, I'm two examples i want to give from these studies we did a, one of the studies we did was, was with um, a group in disability stockport and we were talking to them about um you know we we're talking about individual guilt because often the time when we're talking about trying to um think about actions to avert the climate catastrophe we can get stuck by individual guilt. So this idea that, oh, you know, I'm flying too much or I don't recycle or my greenhouse gas emissions are really high and that can lead to inaction. Um, and what was really interesting was that talking to this group of, in disability Stockport and, and their carers and, and the organisation itself, they said that they made a, an amazing link that I hadn't thought of before and none of the scientists had either really. And they were saying that during austerity, um, they had been made to feel a similar way, a similar sense of guilt that so much money had been taken away from this organisation that they were unable to support their patrons. And they realised that actually this isn't individual guilt at all. And this is the fault of local and central government. And we're just trying to help this situation. And then they made the link themselves and they said, well, it's similar with climate change. Surely this should be a problem mainly solved by local and central government and yeah we can do things as an individual but we shouldn't be made to blame for it and you know that's a that was a really like for me personally as well like an astounding leap and it's like yeah of course like we can look at our individual carbon footprints etc but 
is it really going to, and we, can, we, could, we should and could do, can do things to improve the environment, but unless central and local government and large organisations do things as well, then we're not going to avert the climate crisis in the same meaningful way as if everybody on my street decides to drive an electric car. So that connection was incredibly profound for me and, and came out because of this dialogue. Similarly, in the, in the um, paper on the left from climate risk management, we did a group of work um, with people at TLC St. Luke's, which is a volunteer organisation for people living in Longsite um, in, in the city region of Manchester, people who identify as having um, severe mental health needs. And they wanted to talk about uh, air pollution. So we started writing some poems and then we invited some people in to talk about it and we just established a dialogue. And one of them wrote this poem that I'll always remember. It just goes like this. I've never seen pollution, never noticed it. It's always been there, but I'm unaware of it. Just breathing it in. And for me and for the scientists in the room, this was a really powerful reminder that this subset of people, this group of this community who are probably contributing some of the least to environmental degradation and climate change are going to be the affected the most by it. So again, poetry enables that personification, that localization, that humanization to come through that isn't always possible with the science. So poetry is a really effective way of developing that dialogue and potentially of leading to participation and meaningful action, including policy change as a result. I just want to kind of give you, leave you with something really, and we're going to, we're going to do a brief exercise as well, if that's okay. So I want you to have your writing implements at the ready, um, and we're all going to write some poems. This is a very short exercise, so don't worry. Uh, so get your pens and papers or, or laptop or keyboard, whatever, and we're going to write list poems. So I'm going to give you a prompt, and then when I give you that prompt for 30 seconds, I just want you to write all of the things that you associate with that prompt. And they can be physical things, things that you see, things that you smell, things that you taste, things that you hear, but also memories, ideas, ideologies, anything that comes to your mind, just, just write it down. We're not gonna share these, so they're just for you, okay? And there is a purpose to this. Um, so I'm gonna give you 30 seconds, and from when I say go, and after the prompt. So I want you to list all the things that are in your room, go. 30 seconds. So I'll talk as I'm doing this. So things that you can see, things that you can smell, things that you can hear, things that you can taste, things that you can sense, things that aren't there. Think memories, ideas, etc. It's got about 15 seconds left. Just keep writing until I say stop. We're not going to share these. Um, and this is just basically essentially writing a list poem. Uh, about five seconds left. Just keep writing. Two, one, and stop. Okay. So I'm going to go on to the next prompt, exactly the same exercise, so just draw a line under the, that. So 30 seconds, I want you to do all the things that you are out of a window, go. And if you're in a room without a window, that makes me sad, but just imagine that there's a window instead. So all the things that you can see, all the things that you can smell, all the things that you can taste, all the things that you can imagine, just everything out of that window. Uh, you've got about 15 seconds left. Just keep writing until I say stop. Okay, and about five seconds left, four, three, two, one, and stop. Okay, uh, final prompt, and this will hopefully be quite cathartic for you, and <laughs> but I want you to list all of the things that you associate with the word science, go. They can be positive, they can be negative, anything you want, just keep writing until I say stop. Things that you see, things that you do, like anything that you want that is associated with the word science. You've got about 20 seconds left. About 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. Okay, great. Right, so first of all, all of you have now written three poems, so you're all classified as poets, which is great. But the reason I've, I've given you this as a prompt is poetry is a really powerful way to problem solve. Um, so when you're working on a problem, it doesn't have to be scientific, Oftentimes you'll reach an impasse or a moment where, you know, you're like, oh, I, I don't know how to solve this. So you need to step away from your laptop or your field work or your laboratory experiment or whatever you're doing. And you stop thinking about it. And then suddenly 
a couple of hours or a day or a week later, you're stepping into the shower or onto a train or into your car and the solution comes to you. And that's because you've enabled your brain to think about it and creatively process it. So that's in the subconscious. So that's the creativity incubation period. But that's a really, really passive way of targeting the creativity incubation period. So instead, I offer you this. The next time you have a problem that you can't solve, write a poem about it instead. So what it does is it makes your brain think about the problem in a different way. And I'm not promising that you'll have a problem, you write a poem and you'll instantly come up with a solution. But what you will do is it will force you to think about it in a different way. And even if you don't come up with an exact solution, it will enable you to reframe it. It will enable you to reimagine it. And you'll probably also have some tangential learnings associated with it as well. Plus, writing poetry is just good for the mind and good for the soul and good for the heart. So the next time you have a problem, just stop. What I tend to do is I, I recommend just writing a list poem, first of all, about the problem for about a minute, because it just think about the problem and then just write everything you can about that for a minute. It gets you starting to think about it. It gets your creative juices flowing and then it gives you a word bank for poems going forward as well. I, I also, like for people who are new to poetry, I always think using a specific poetic form, such as a haiku or a nonette or a sonnet or a kiriel or, or a gerzel, like whatever you want, is really powerful because it can provide the scaffolding that you need to be creative. You know, telling someone write a poem is quite, it's like do science, it's quite large. Whereas if you say, okay, here's your topic, write a sonnet about it. Like using that structure helps to breed creativity as well. So just try it. The next time you have a problem, write a list poem, try and write a poem about it and see what learning comes as a result. And then finally, in the next few minutes, I just want to talk about poetry to collaborate. Um, you know, poetry is an amazing way to collaborate, especially between scientists and non-scientists and between poets and scientists. So here's two projects that I've been involved with. Um, one, A Change of Climate, which was a book of climate change poetry written by people from across the world uh, with a foreword from um, Valerie Masson del Malt, who's actually a Nobel Prize winner, uh, and Helen Malt, who's a celebrated British poet. And basically we invited people from across the world to write poems about climate change. We had 126 entries from 26 countries in five languages, and we just picked the top 20. Um, as a way to help hopefully personify and localize climate change. Similarly, Experimental Words is a long running project with my collaborator, Dan Simpson, where we invite scientists and poets to work together. And it's not about asking a poet to write a poem about the scientist's work. It's rather about exploring the liminal spaces between, because a lot of my work is, is also around this idea of if you, if you do science, you don't have to just be a scientist or just be a poet. You know, poets have amazing research skills. Scientists have incredible creativity skills. So actually what we should be doing is we should be encouraging collaborations that encourage scientists to bring out their creative side, poets to bring out their research side, and to move away from this like pigeonholed existence that we have and obsession with labels and rather that just we're all human beings with, with infinite potential. Um, just because, you know, climate change and sustainability is quite a big theme. This, I just want to read this poem because I think it's, I'm almost finished now, two more slides, but this is just really to say about some of the positivity we can have when we think about climate change as well. So this poem from the collection, The Change of Climate, is by Emily Cotterell, who's a Welsh poet. I have loved coal like a teenage girl loves an older guitarist with a rough black smudge of eyeliner. I've built my life on it, screamed down decades for it. Coal not dull, barred my whole soul for it. But old women gossip about the pit. I know the world has had enough of it. Coal with its head full of history, strong arms, filthy engines, heavy, the small town sex of it broken bodies, white knuckle wives. The silence of canaries has risen from slag heaps and pit heads to thick air spluttering into anyone born late with withered old miners' lungs. I've loved coal, but recently when I sit in the fresh place built on the scar of my grandfather's pit, I have loved birdsong, 
green space, the safety and hope of it, wind turbines, rising white beacons, sharp armed, slicing clean paths to a future. And then just finally to finish with, um, a, a project that I'm involved with and I helped to launch uh, is the Poetry and Science Journal Consilience. So poetry journals are great, right? But a speaker is an embittered poet. Like when you submit your work, it's either kind of just accepted or rejected and that's it. Whereas in science, what we see is that we have the peer review system. So yes, it has its foibles, but at the same time, what happens is people submit um, a piece of work and then it's reviewed by uh, anonymous reviewers. And then an editor will look at those anonymous reviews and um, synthesize that information and collaborate with the original author and ask them to make revisions to improve the piece. So it accepts that when a piece of work is presented, it's neither imperfect, it's neither perfect nor rubbish, but rather somewhere in between. And so we wanted to do the same with poetry. So we set up Consilience in April 2020. And basically, um, we have four issues a year. Uh, people submit their work and then the poem, which has to be science themed, is sent out to two independent reviewers who give comments and then an editor synthesizes that information and then liaises with the poet. And some of these comments might just be, this is brilliant, change nothing, or think about the title or whatever. And it becomes this collaborative experience. Um, we've published the work of over 100 people now. We, we're a team of 78 volunteers from six continents and 12 time zones. Uh, so super inclusive. We publish uh, and accept work non, in non-English language as well, uh, as well as artwork. Um, you can find our links there and you're really, really welcome to come and join us. Uh, and I think that this, this way is, a, again, it's a way of helping to communicate science, but it's about helping to promote this idea that science and poetry are not mutually exclusive entities, but rather they're congruent and complementary disciplines. You know, science and poetry, neither of them have all of the pieces that help us to exactly understand the world and the way in which we live. But if we put them together, it gives us a far more um, effective whole and a better way of seeing and understanding. So that's all I wanted to say really on this matter. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, if no um, questions are apparent, or Pat might have a couple of questions as well. So I'll answer a couple of questions and then Pat and I will move on to reading some poems together and then we'll have an open Q&A at the end as well. That sounds okay. Thank you. Uh, so well, I don't think there's any questions coming through the chat. So I, I just had a question about children. Have you had experience of working through these kind of uh, interactions with children? And I'm thinking particularly children who were forced into the silo of science or the silo of arts early on at school. That's a really good question, Pat. Like we've done quite a lot of, well, I've done a lot of work in going into schools and doing this exact thing. So quite a nice exercise we have is we go into we work with primary school children and we do a scientific experiment like quite a basic one like you know elephant's toothpaste where you put chemicals together and it it comes up um and but in, instead of writing up the experiment as a science report you know with introduction uh, methodology results analysis conclusion we write it up as a poem um, and then we compare that to traditional report so that we can see that there's two different ways of, of knowing and being. And, you know, speaking from my own personal experience, you know, the British education system has been great at, uh, at, at encouraging interdisciplinarity. And I know that when I was, you know, 16 and thinking about my future, I picked, you know, maths, further maths, physics and chemistry as my A-levels, um, which, you know, forced me down a certain route. And I've always been very lucky and I've had that creative side as well. But... I think working with children um, in that way is a really powerful way to help them understand that there are ways in which you can continue to explore multiple sides of your, you know, creative and scientific endeavours and that one doesn't necessarily cancel out the other either. Okay, thanks for that, Sam. I think we should move on in the interests of the time. Of course. Um, so there are my key messages, basically. Science communication exists as a spectrum. Poetry is an effective tool to communicate to an audience it's also a great medium to give voice 
and it can help you to actively target the incubation period. The next time you've got a problem, write a poem. Uh, for more information, check out my book, blah, 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 Science Communication Through Poetry, available in, well, probably in all good bookshops and certainly online as well. Ask your librarian. So I'm going to pass over to Anna now, and Anna's going to read a poem to us from Ruth Eiler. Ruth's a professor in computing at Harriet Watt, and he's also an amazing poet. Um, I, I think Ruth's on the call just in the background as well, but Ruth's an incredibly talented poet. And uh, we have been delighted to publish her work um, with Consilience as well. And a lot of Ruth's work explores the intersections between science and society as well. So I'm going to pass over to Anna uh, from HW Sustainability Strategy Group. And Anna's going to read uh, Ruth's poem, Coding. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, Ruth, for entrusting your, uh, your work to my voice. So this is Coding. Lines expand under my fingers as night fills with sleepers' dreams. A soft percussion from the keyboard, the persistent chatter of the disc while my typing forms machinery. Once, on my knees before the broken dishwasher, I asked you to fetch my pliers. You brought me wire cutters, then wrench, then pincers, needing more than my vague gesture, snippety snip. Now I must think as if a computer, but shuttles binary, not meaning. This is my dream of a machine empty planning until a processor tries to execute what I claimed would work. Like real life, it's a series of bugs, minus the common sense that says, stop, I'll tell you the exact look of pliers. The impatience that says, fetch them yourself if you can't get the description right. I close down, sleep, passed as a parameter, forced to select, iterate, recurse into the endless corridor of mirror in the mirror, follow instructions that don't work into paths that never terminate. And the next day, done. Triangles flock like fish or birds on my screen, rippling with colors while everyone says, how beautiful. A substanceless machine performs an answer to its imagined question. Thanks so much, Anna, and thanks Ruth as well. So Pat, I think I'm gonna pass on to you now. You're gonna read some a selection as well. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for that, and thanks, Anna, and, th and thanks to Ruth, because she's a stalwart of our poetry uh, group. So uh, briefly, before we uh, read, read poems, I'm not going to read this full poem, but Edwin Morgan was given an honorary degree by Harriet Watt. He was a previous Macca, uh, Scotland's uh, bard, if you like, uh, and he celebrated his 100th, uh, his centenary last year. Um, and, you know, we're, we're interested in well-being, and it's quite interesting, the title here, uh, you, one would assume that Edwin Morgan started with a list poem. So you imagine that this started out as a list poem, a list of uh, poetry terms and a list of uh, scientific terms. And then he, uh, he worked out how to put the two together. And I'm not going to read all of those because some will jump out of you. Uh, I had to uh, look things up. I th Magnesium and Crashaw. Well, Crashaw is a, an old uh, 18th, 17th century poet, I think. So uh, I had to find out which was the poet bit and which was the science bit in some cases. Um, I'm amused by DNA and ABBA, which I wrote, read to begin with. But of course, you know, poets uh, have this way of describing the ending of their uh, lines in, in a stanza. And they would say A, B, B, A. That's the rhyming scheme. So that line probably should read DNA and A, B, B, A rather than ABBA, the, the pop group. Uh, Ergs and bacon. I mean, an erg is a is an Aeolian sea. I know this because, uh, in fact, the rocks that sit underneath James Watt there on Harriet Watt's plinth, uh, those are those are sandstones uh, deposited in an erg, uh, an Aeolian sea, a windblown desert for many people. So I like the the combination of ergs and bacon. Bacon, I assume, is another poet, and one could go through there. And and if it's not a scientific term, it's probably a poetic term. And you know, I like the way that the poem ends up with poem and poem. Poem is a botany term for the piece in the center of the apple that includes the seed, I think. So I, I had to look up that. Um, but I think this is a, a clever way of putting science and, and poetry together. And thank Edwin Morgan for his contribution. And I'm glad that we recognize that as a university not famed for its poetry at that time. So. Uh, 
the, the second one uh, is comes from this uh, book that uh, Alison, our, our uh, poet in resident, that came to Herit Watt and spent uh, a week writing poems. Um, and she had a lovely epigram there. That's the, the line underneath the title, which says, who was it who said that if something is complex, don't try to simplify it, but make it more complex instead? I think it was Imran Peretta. So she was uh, reading some background to time-lapse seismic. It's one of the things that the Lyle group uh, at Herit Watt and the BGS work on, is this idea that we can monitor uh, when we are injecting CO2 into the ground in carbon capture and storage, we can monitor it using seismic. And I think she read this technical paper by the team and then was sort of into a dream space. So this is more of a dream space poem. And I wonder whether it's Alison dreaming about all these uh, seismic uh, terms, the asymmetric migration of eels, if you like, uh, time-lapse seismic plume, all these technical words, as she was uh, uh, dozing off to sleep. Or maybe it was the, think, the fact that she thinks scientists dream that they can actually do this, they can actually put CCS back in the ground, and I think uh, uh, perhaps that's what she was getting at in this poem. Um, so if you pull up the next slide, Sam, I mean, this is uh, one of my own poems. So this is something I do understand a little bit more. This uh, poem ended up as in the front piece of a, of a book. A book was really a catalog of all these, uh, what we call thin sections. So uh, the top two images, uh, sorry, the top image and the bottom image represent the inside of one of our carbonate reservoir rocks where the blue is the space and the white is the uh, rock. And of course, you know, when we look at our cities, sometimes we're building all of our white concrete into this uh, blue sky, and that's captured in that middle image. So, and this tries to describe the origin of, of this rock and the space in it uh, to, to a non-technical specialist. Book of blue and white, you are a bound memento of a child's first paintings. Each one contains a story. If you look very carefully, the world started out blue. Along came some white shells, quietly raising valves skyward, filter feeding on what drifted by. More valves arrived by waves, others on storms, and some in a downright broken mess. As they slipped underground, their lights went out as natural cement took hold. Small white crystals grew into larger suffocating domains, but nothing stays the same forever as conditions change. Acidic, aggressive fluids arrived and opened up the subterranean world. Blue rays reached down into the ground. Voids draw aficionados to view this book of blue and white. Thank you, Sam. Back over to you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Pat. So I'm just going to, I guess, read one poem to pick up on. And then we're really happy to open the floor to questions about anything that we, we've said today. Um, I wanted to share this poem really because, you know, as I said at the very beginning, when I was when I write my poems every week, it's it's really thinking about research that is potentially important or interesting to people, and so much work and research has been done recently into the importance of green space and also blue space. So green space being like forests and parks, recreational areas, blue space being anywhere where we can see water, and you know there's we know that green space and blue space are incredibly uh, important for for mental health and well-being actually blue space even more than even more so than green space um but, but unfortunately we also know that people who have access to green space uh, within walking distance of their house tend to be or are far more likely to be white middle class men um and so there's a non-equity of this access to green space and, and to blue space and the positive health benefits that that has as well. And a, a recent research paper, which is what this poem was inspired by, actually looked at over 2 million people in California and looked at satellite imagery to show how close they were to green space and then also were able it was all um, publicly available data, look at their um, medical insurance um, records and worked out you know, the average cost, uh, ignoring all of the variables, just based purely on how close they were to green space or not. 
And I think it worked out as about, it, it cost on average about $400 a year less um, for the medical insurance company if people had access to green space than not. So, you know, we know that we we can feel sometimes in our, I think anyway, in like our, in our, in our souls that we need to be near nature and actually scientific research as well as poetry is, is helping to prove that that is the case and that there really is a positive, hugely positive benefit for well-being, but that maybe we need to do better, those of us in a privileged position, to make sure that this is accessible to all. So that's the background to this piece, which is called Greening Healthcare. Cast from beds unmade, weary bones and aching hearts cry out for some return. A thousand shades of green drowned by waves of stilted grey. High watermarks of progress against the tonal shifts of nature's loss. We catch glimpses in the chrome. Avenues of shaded leaves, gardens hung from balconies, potted plants and roadside trees. Cures that we have always known from places that were once our home and that's it so thank you very much for listening to part of myself um and and also thank you very much anna for your contribution and ruth for your words and um, we've got a few we've got a few minutes for questions if people would like to post any feel free to drop them into the chat or even come onto mic if possible as well and we're really happy to answer those in the next three or four minutes before we need to wrap up thank you Sam, I just got a comment to follow up on that greening healthcare because the campus at Heriot Watt, which you would uh, normally we would have been having this live, you know, um, and then we could go out and have a walk around the campus and generate a poem from the campus. And of course, we're quite lucky, and I think this is important for the well-being on the campus that we have this green space. Um, so, uh, how does that work on our campus in the middle of the desert, if you like? Uh, where is that blue space, green space, or brown space? I mean, the the, the campus I'm thinking of in uh, in in Dubai, you know, where we have a campus. Um, things are not quite so green over there. That's a really really good, good point, Pat. So, Pat, I think the honest answer to that is I don't know, but I also think that the research really is about nature. So again, I'm probably looking at this from like quite a Western point of view in which the nature that I associate is with green space and blue space. But if you're in an environment in which you feel connected to nature and that nature is, you know, is brown space or white space, depending on if it's like desert, et cetera, then I think it will be as much applicable. I think that'll be a really interesting research study as well. So the honest answer is I don't know, but I imagine that it extends beyond just green and blue into that, sense of nature and connecting with harmony as well. I'll just add, there's been a question in the chat, although it's more of a request than a question, just asking if you can share your link to the uh, science communication through poetry book again. And um, yeah, of course, I will, I'll, I'll do that now. Um, Brilliant. Thank you for us. Always, always happy to be asked to share my link to my work. Uh, and if you can't get it, like ask your librarian to get a copy for you as well. And another question has come in from Jack. He says, it's great to see how science and the arts can work together to allow a greater expression of individual ideas and experiences. I also enjoyed hearing how poetry can be used to problem solve. So more of a statement than a question. Great. Thanks, Jackie. So yeah, I'd, I'd honestly, I find it to be really like a cathartic process, but also really helpful as well. So I would really, really um, encourage people to write poems and um, if, you, if it managed to solve your problem, please get in contact with me to let me know. Thanks, Jen, also for posting uh, that link to everybody for, for my book that's in there. I'll just drop into the chat as well um, my email address, because if you want to follow up with anything, uh, I am here as well. Uh, and uh, Pat's put his details in there as well for, for further, further information there. I'll just share my screen again to go back to um, PowerPoint slide as well, so we can see that. About the questions okay great and if there's no more questions forthcoming then i'd just um like to thank everyone for joining us um thank you very much to the alumni team for putting this together um and i'd encourage people to continue to um 
chat to Pat and I offline about this. Um, I'll put on the final slide now, and I guess, Adam, do, I'll pass back to you just to wrap us up, really, and to say, yeah, thanks very much, everyone. Well, uh, thank you, Sam. I think the thank yous should be coming from me uh, to you, to Patrick, and to, to Anna um, for, for that wonderful um, presentation and for your readings. Um, I'm sure everyone who attended today will be inspired to, to go away and perhaps um, think about this um, more broadly and do, uh, do some writing themselves. And, and as you mentioned, you know, think about how they might uh, solve problems in the future or engage with others or community, communicate complex problems in the future. So, you know, we really appreciate um, you sharing your knowledge and expertise in this area and for your, your brilliant readings um, to, to, to all three of you. So, so thank you very much again. We do very much appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to thank our alumni and our students and staff who have attended this session today for joining us. And um, as we've um, mentioned during, during the session, we share some links in the chat there to our university uh, research pages, which both Sam and, and Patrick um, uh, referred to. And we've also, uh, I think we're, we're going to share uh, Patrick and Sam's respective websites as well, so you can keep in touch and look at their work through that. Uh, and also a link to uh, our update contact details um, uh, on, the, on, our, on our alumni web pages. It's really important that anyone who hasn't updated their details in a while uh, does that so that we can keep in touch with you and invite you to sessions like this in the future. So thank you all uh, again. Uh, thank you again to the speakers. Um, this concludes today's event and I hope you have a brilliant rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>